evening, everybody. Uh, we are going to end up uh, working on uh, Unit 15, dealing with real estate financing. Uh, please know we are probably going to break this into two sections uh, because we're not going to be able to get through 80 slides this evening. So uh, we're going to get through about half and then we'll have our second part uh, and cover the second part of our lecture. So we're going to get through about 40 slides tonight and we'll do 40 slides tomorrow. And I think that we should be able to in another chapter or unit uh, break it down in a way that we can end up uh, covering two in another in another one. So we'll try to keep on task. Um, so tonight we're going to go ahead and we're going to talk about uh, describing the various primary sources of mortgage money, uh, the loan application process, uh, the payment plans that are available to real estate purchasers. We're also going to explain the provisions of and qualifications for conventional FHA, VA, agricultural, and Texas loan programs. Uh, we'll further distinguish among the various types of creative financing techniques uh, that address borrowers' different needs further identify the mechanisms that are going to be used uh, by the Federal Reserve, which is often referred to as the Fed. Uh, so to control the economy and the entities that participate in the secondary mortgage market. Uh, we'll further review the legislation affecting real estate financing and activities uh, that would be classified as what we call predatory lending or mortgage fraud. <clears throat> we'll further describe the two theories of mortgage law and the two primary loan instruments that are executed for a mortgage loan in Texas. And we'll identify the basic provisions of a promissory note uh, and a deed of trust. We'll further explain the procedures involved in a foreclosure, including the right of redemption and distinguish among the foreclosure avoidance options. So as you can kind of see there, there's a lot of material uh, but we have a limited amount of time this evening, so we're not going to be able to get through it all. We'll get through the majority of it. Uh, but again, I kind of want to be able to spend some time explaining this uh, because the fact is, is real estate financing does have a big impact uh, on the overall, uh, basically, the process in real estate. You're going to deal with financing a, a lot, although not the terms of the loan, but you will be dealing with a mortgage lender very closely. So, of course, in this situation is there are two different types of markets, okay? Uh, the very first one, of course, is what we call the primary mortgage market, and, and that's where you go down to the bank uh, and you borrow money. If, uh, Mr. Grossman, if you need it to, in a situation, you need it to buy a house, for example. Uh, in that particular situation, uh, if Mr. Grossman was going to purchase a house, He's not going to end up going to, uh, to to the government, to the president and saying, can I borrow some money, okay? He's going to go down to either a savings association, a commercial bank, a savings bank, an insurance, well, not even really an insurance company, uh, but they're included in it, uh, mortgage banking companies, maybe even a mortgage broker or a credit union, okay? Most of these individuals are going to be ones that will lend money to you, okay? Uh, so in this situation is, Mr. Grossman needs to buy a house, he'll go down to Mr. Eugene's bank, he'll say, Mr. Eugene, can I borrow $400,000? Mr. Eugene will say, most certainly, you can borrow 400,000 at 10% interest, okay? Uh, so in that situation is, Mr. Grossman, guess what happens? You sign with Mr. Eugene, he gives you, well, he don't give you the money, but he'll uh, he'll go in and he'll fund the title company so the funds can go to the purchase of the house. Okay, a lot of people think when you buy a house, if Travis wants to purchase a house, he just walks down to Bank of America and he walks in and says, I need 400,000 and they just give him 400,000 in cash, okay? And then he just walks down and he gives Mr. Eugene 400,000 in cash, Mr. Eugene gives him title. Not how it happens. Okay, not how it happens. Uh, what happens is it's all paper in regards to not cash paper, but just paper. So what happens is uh, when Mr. Travis goes down to the bank, he's going to go down, 
they will pre-approve Mr. Uh, they'll, they'll pre-approve Mr. Travis for a loan. Okay, and in that particular situation, they will pre-approve him. And then what they'll end up doing is, is they will say, now, Mr. Travis, you have four hundred thousand dollars that's available to you, but in this particular situation is Mr. Uh, Travis understand that you are going to have to go through our process of getting the house approved and things of that nature before we will transfer or wire the money to the title company. Okay. They never are actually going to go over and just give Travis money. Okay. They, they give it to the bank and the bank, ends up in that situation so the title company then funds it and wires all the money out but never does the bank just give travis the cash to go spend okay i've actually had people ask me that before and that's why i want to spend a little bit of time on that uh, the secondary mortgage market now the thing about secondary is we're going to talk a little later on but these are the individuals that purchase loans okay from these individuals up here that makes sense. So the secondary mortgage market purchases the notes from the individuals up here. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, a lot of people ask me, they'll say, you know, Mr. You, or Mr. Nobles, uh, you know, I want to end up, I want to make money in real estate. I want to be a real estate agent. How much will I make as a real estate agent my first year in business? And they actually just, NAR, National Association of Realtors, just posted recently that for the first year, most new real estate agents only make on average about $9,000 their first year, okay? Reason being is, Travis, what are you doing your first year? Paying a lot of money. Paying a lot of money and having to build a business, right? Yeah, figuring You're it all out. Figuring it all out, trying to drum up leads, try to, try to convince people to use you. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of work, okay? So your first year, on average, you make about nine grand, all right? So in that particular situation, is that enough money to really live off of? Well, not unless you were a college student. If you're a college student, you probably, you've been there, you've done that, you've ended up, you've, you've lived cheap, okay? I've been there myself. But, um, but Mr. Eugene, could you quit your job and make $9,000? Not hard. Not at all. You gotta pay bills, right? So what happens is a lot of times agents will ask me, well, what are some other things that I could do to make money to supplement that income until I can start making good money in real estate? And what I always tell people in this situation is, is this, is that in some situations, some real estate agents actually are also mortgage brokers, okay? So now understand here, you cannot write your own policies, meaning that if Mr. Eugene, you are representing Travis as a real estate agent, you cannot also, you cannot go in and also write his loan. Does that make sense? Because there's a conflict of interest. So in that situation, most of the time, and again, you gotta to talk to the place that you're working with, because even some mortgage companies won't allow you to have a, or activate your mortgage broker's license without you going in and releasing your real estate or inactivating your real estate license. They don't want you having both active because it's a liability for them in some situations. Because what happens? If we let Mr. Uh, Eugene, you can practice as a real estate agent and a mortgage broker, what are you gonna to try to end up doing if you're only making $9,000 a year? Are you gonna to try to pull some little slide deals or whatever just so you can make some extra cash? So, yeah, you're gonna to try to do some something right to make some extra money so while your your broker your your mortgage broker or mortgage company step and tells you you can't do it what are you going to try to do you're going to try to slide things around without step and finding out that's right and what often happens Stephen, when your your mortgage brokers do this type of stuff what happens to you legally your liability goes where goes right up. through the roof right into yeah so next thing you know Mr. Uh, Stephan here gets a letter from Travis's attorney that says that there's some crooked stuff going on. And so now you're getting sued. Okay. So again, in these situations, a lot of mortgage companies do not or will not sponsor you or allow you to be appointed by them if you hold a real estate license. Now, with that being said, 
some companies might let you. And there's a key emphasis on that, might, okay? Some of them might let you do it, but they put extreme strict guidelines on what you can do. They may say something to the effect that, you know, Mr. Eugene, you got your mortgage brokers. We will allow you to write loans, but you can only write loans outside of where you work. Meaning that if you work in Bryan College Station and that's where 90% of your business is done, we'll let you write in Houston, Austin, Dallas, or other places, but you cannot write or you cannot work in the areas in which you write, if that makes sense. So on the side, you could have a side hustle by you writing mortgages for other areas, but you cannot write for your own brokerage. This is where coming in being an independent brokerage is where an independent brokerage comes into play. Because say that Travis, you go get your mortgage broker's license and you work for KW. Well, what's the problem is he cannot write loans for his own brokerage. Well, if KW is everywhere, where can Travis go and write loans for? Nowhere. Nowhere. But if Travis's brokerage is limited to certain areas, he can still be writing elsewhere. Okay, that's where one of those benefits come in to being an independent broker versus a national wide chain. Okay, so in these different uh, situations, is there can be some individuals that do get their mortgage license. I myself have my mortgage license. I have kind of put it on hold simply because the fact is I don't have time really to do it. I thought I would, and in the beginning when I first got it, it was it's only two weeks of training, guys and gals. Two weeks of training. It's like a two hour course that you have to be in live. It's not recorded. You actually have to be in it. It's very strict on the trainings. Uh, but in two weeks, you can actually finish the course, go sit for your test, you pass your test, and you're a, uh, an inactive, it's like real estate, you're an inactive MLO. Okay. And for you to do that, you have to take a course that's approved by SAFE Act. Okay. And that was the Federal Secure and Federal or Fair Enforcement Mortgage Licensing Act of 2008. It requires that residential mortgage loan originators who make, transact, or negotiate mortgage loans, they have to be enrolled in the NMLS and they have to be licensed by their state. So you, once you finish your training, you actually have to end up, you have to pay to be part of the NMLS and on top of that, you have to be licensed by your state. Okay, Mr. Christian. So it applies to persons who are employees or independent contractors. Okay, uh, so again, like I said, Mr. Stahl could be a employee of a bank. He may go work, and this sometimes happens, he may go work at say Chase Bank. He works at Chase Bank. He is a mortgage loan originator. He is exclusive to Chase Bank. And uh, so he's an employee of Chase and he deals with loans, but he happens to have his real estate license on the side. So in that situation is he would be classified as an employee in that situation, okay? But Travis is only allowed to sell what products, Mr. Eugene? What bank? Just, Just Chase Bank. Tra Travis cannot go to Wells Fargo and say, hey, I'm going to sell you all as well, but I work for, for Chase over here. No, only one bank. Okay. Now, that's why it's kind of like insurance agents. You can be an independent insurance agent or a captive agent. Captive means you're locked to one company. A independent is you're on your own. It's just like a real estate broker. You're independent. You're on your own. So the same thing happens as well as MLOs. Mr. Eugene, you go and get your license, but you decide I'm gonna be an independent contractor. I'm gonna be a, what's called a mortgage broker, okay? Not a mortgage banker, that's what Travis would be as a mortgage banker because he works for a bank. You would be a mortgage broker. And so Mr. Eugene, your thing is, is that you work with a wide variety of banks. Now you may not be able to quote Travis's bank, they may not be part of the group, but you're able to quote other banks, okay? So there may be, for example, Capital One may not have physical locations in your area. 
So they may allow you to quote their system because they don't have a bank here. So what happens is, is you as an independent contractor could quote on their behalf, okay? But what you're doing, Mr. Eugene and Travis, is you're both taking loan applications and you're discussing the rates or terms. Same thing like what we do as real estate agents. What do we do? They fill out a, a contract with us. What are we doing? We're gonna to explain to them what's in the contract, what's all involved. But the only thing is, is this is focused from a financing perspective, okay? Now, again, it, there are exemptions to the safe debt. Real estate agents, if all compensation are from the commissions. So real estate agents are exempt from this act if all of their compensation is simply from commission and not a fee, okay? Persons working for family members are also exempt or property owners making no more than five loans a year is also exempt, okay? Now, what exactly, so we're playing this, this class, we're playing it a little bit more from the aspect of not only just as a real estate agent, but we're trying to show you what the mortgage loan originator does, okay? So this is what your client is going through. In real life, Travis, question for you. In real life, if Mr. Eugene was your, your client and you want to get him pre-approved because he needs to get pre-approved before he goes, starts looking, do you go and sit down and fill out this loan application with him? No, what do you do? Send it over to Jake, right? Yeah. Okay, you'll tell you, Mr. Eugene, Mr. Eugene, here's uh, Jake's phone number and uh, give him a call. He'll be more than glad to help you go through that process. Do you do anything else, Travis? That's it. You don't do anything else. But the thing is, is oftentimes as real estate agents, we sometimes lose out on this. We kind of get lazy in some situations. I'm gonna be honest, I've been there before, okay? We sometimes get in that situation where we got so much going on that we don't follow up with this stuff, okay? Because here's what happens, and I can tell you from experience in my own, if I have Stefan, I tell Stefan, hey Stefan, uh, you need to get pre-approved before I show you properties. Here's, a, here's three lenders' phone numbers. I've given you three lenders' phone numbers. And I go ahead and one of those lenders is Miss Leela, okay? So I tell Miss Leela, I call her after giving you the, the three numbers. I tell you that I prefer Miss Leela, but you can pick whoever you want. Remember, you cannot designate or tell a person wh who they have to use, but you can give recommendations. So I tell Miss, I tell you, call Miss Leela, that's who I prefer. So I call Miss Leela and I say, hey, Miss Leela, Stefan is going to be contacting you and he's gonna to wanna to get pre-approved. And here's his name and phone number, okay? Well, what happens most of the time, Travis, in reality, what do I do? After I've done that part, what, do I, what does my brain just think? Well, I've done what I'm supposed to do. Lila will get a hope to, to study. Yeah, I could go in and work on the next client. Yeah. Okay? I got work to do. Yeah, I got other stuff to do. I got showings and all this stuff. Well, what actually happens? <coughs> Stephen, do you ever actually call Lila? Nope. And Leela, she may end up, she may be just as busy. Do you think she might call Stefan? Nope. So in that situation is, I'm thinking that this is being taken care of and I'm over here focused on something else and what eventually happens? He gets annoyed because he thinks Leela's gonna call him. Leela gets annoyed because I'm giving her quote unquote leads that never convert, that she's not reaching out to. And what's the problem? We all lose. Now, now what's going to happen? You're just going to go lose. find another agent and go and get them. And that's it. Okay. That's it. Or this is another way. Or Miss Leela actually calls and gets a hope to Stefan and gives him this right here, by the way, for him to get pre-approved. They, she sends him the uniform residential loan application and gives it to says, Stefan, I need you to complete that. Okay. Well, guess what? Stefan being a, a millennial, what happens to that? It just sits there or the paper gets lost. And then next thing you know, Stefan don't answer Leela's call when Leela's calling him. Oh, it's just that woman bugging me again, right? Well, here's the problem is, whose job is it to stay on top of that stuff? It's mine. It's part of my job to be calling Leela and saying, hey, Leela, how's things going with Stefan? 
Is Stefan ending up? Is he is he getting the stuff done? No. Okay, thank you for letting me know. Stefan, what the heck's going on? Why are you not complete? Do you need to come in the office? I'll help you complete it if you come on in the office. Now, can I physically really help him complete the form? No. But can I help kind of answer or guide him in the right direction? And you can lock him in that closet with paper. Yeah, I can lock him in the closet. That's a good one. Yeah. I'll call Miss Leela and Miss Leela will say, lock him in the closet, Justin. I'll say, yeah. gotcha, Miss Leela. I got it. Don't forget to turn the light off. Excuse me. Yeah, I'll give him a pen and pe in, that, in that form and, and the light, and that's it. Nothing else. You know, you're getting a you little too comfortable huh? with throwing Leela around. <laughs> <laughs> say that one more time, Miss Leela. I said y'all getting a little too comfortable throwing the name Leela around. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Leela just gonna lock him up. Yeah, Leela gonna do this. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> but you know, the key thing in this situation is, is that sometimes you want to do that. I'm gonna be honest. I've had one client, no joke, that I went over there, y'all, and um, I had went over there and I told my client. And they said, well, I can't get the form to download. And I'm like, how can you not get the form to download? So then I go to, uh, I go to my office, I print it off, I drive it to them, and I give it to them. Okay, here you go. Okay, I'll get it, I'll get it done, I'll get it done. Go back, I go back to the office, do my normal day, call the next day, have you got the form done? Oh, shoot, I left that on my desk in my office, and they cleaned it, and it probably got thrown away. And so, you know what I finally just did? I just had what we call a come to Jesus talk. And I just looked, and it wasn't Stephen, but I just looked at Stephen, and I say, do you really want to buy a house? Really, do you want to buy a house? Well, yeah, I do. Well, he doesn't look like it, because you sure as heck ain't doing nothing. The key thing in this situation is, is yeah, You've got to end up sometimes as a real estate agent, you got to stay on them. See, a lot of people think in real estate is, ah, it can wait. Yeah, it can wait. I learned that after my fourth transaction. My fourth one was a $750,000 transaction. And I was like, woo, woo, I'm going to make money. $750,000, I'm going to make bank. All right. So I sent them to the person. Well, a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar client, do they want you working? Yeah, yeah. They want you. They expect you to be at their beck and call. Yeah. They expect you to go drive out to their property, to bring the forms to them. Sometimes even bring them a snack or whatever. But they want you to be at their beck and call. They want you at their beck and call. Right? But the key thing that comes into this situation is, is that I ended up, I just thought that the, the lender would actually call me and get everything followed up with. Guess what? I called that lender and that lender happened to end up, it's just like real estate, by the way, everybody, real estate has the highest turnover of most industries. It just does. Okay. Well, guess what? Lenders are the same way. So I ended up. I thought that this lender was a good lender. She's an older lady. She was very quick at responding, getting things done. I thought she was on top of it. I gave the lender her this, inf this client's information. The lady just up and quit the next day. Never told me nothing. So my client had been calling, 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 calling this number that no longer was good. So I end up after 30 days, because I was just being lazy, after 30 days, I call back the client. Hey, where are we at with everything? Oh, well, I'm under contract. What do you mean you're under contract? Well, your lady never called. I thought y'all just didn't want the business, so I went and got another agent. Gone. So as a real estate agent, it is your duty to follow up with your clients. But you also have to know that there's a limit on how many you can get. Do you think one person stepping can deal with 15 people, 15 clients? No. Why do you say no? Um, you just can't do it. It's not it's not impossible. Work. It's impossible. So the thing that comes down to it is, I've tried it live and I can't. Yeah, it's, it's hard. Yeah. It's very difficult. 
I've learned that five is about the average. If you can take four or five, you're pretty good. Yeah. But if you start getting over four or five, you're done. Okay. So in this situation in regards to the loan application, when your client wants to get pre-approved, they have to complete that uniform residential loan application. The lender is then going to, in that situation, qualify that buyer. Now, real quick, Mr. Eugene, how much weight does that carry right there? A whole lot. Absolutely. Absolutely nothing. That's okay. A pre-qualification letter versus a pre-approval is this. Also pre-qualification pre is this. You got online, Mr. Eugene, and you got in there and you start searching on your favorite lender's website and you start just playing around with the numbers and you say, well, if I make $2 million this year and I charge 1% interest, then I can buy that $5 million property and print. And guess what? You got a letter. Yes. But has anything, Travis, been verified? Nope. What Mr. Eugene said? Uh-uh. So he handed it to me. Let's tear it up. Yeah, it's just garbage. Throw it back at you. Yeah. Don't give me, don't come in here with that crap. That's right. Give somebody else. This pre-qualification pre means oh, nothing. <laughs> nothing. So if you start working with a client and they say, well, I'm pre-qualified. If they say, I'm pre-qualified, well, that means nothing. It means not absolutely want one thing to me, period. But if you say you're pre-approved, guess what that means? They actually verified your stuff, Mr. Eugene. And they have said that, yes, you actually have this money and you are approved so long as the house and other things meet our qualifications. Okay. So, Mr. Eugene, you could be pre-approved for, say, $5 million, but guess what? The property or title may not meet their standards, and they won't give it to you. Okay? And you can ask Travis. He's been through a couple like that, where they we thought they were good. Yeah, they're great. And then the property just didn't meet it. Yeah. So, it can happen. Okay? Another thing that they're going to look at is your FICO score. A lot of people say, well, do I have to have good credit or can I get a house for 500? If I have a credit score, can I get a house for 500 credit score? No. Uh, no. No. <laughs> FICO score normally, now when we were doing good, when the market was good, uh, there was some banks that would lend down to 620. There was one, I think, a long time ago when we were really good. Some banks were down to 580. Now understand, the lower you go, Mr. Eugene, what happens? What happens to the interest rate? Why does it go up? <laughs> You're a high risk person. You're very high risk. Okay. But right now, you normally cannot get a loan unless you're around 680 to 700. And even at that, interest rates are high. Okay. So while there are programs that are normally out there for people with bad credit, it ultimately in this situation, they're going to check your FICO scores. Now they're going to look at all three. You have three scores. They're going to look at all three and they average them. So Mr. Eugene, what if Mr. Garrett, he has a, say a eight or a, yeah, 800, a 700, and a 400. Did that 400, can we just forget about that and just go off the top two? Why can't we? You have to average all three. And y'all, the reason I say that is I actually had a client that had happened that, or had, that had happened to. Uh, they actually were 720, 760, and 320. And what had happened was somebody had ended up, got a hold to their social, and had applied for a lot of loans that only reported to one of the court or one of the companies. And so their credit score from that one company was just bold, just horrible. Okay. Well, that client was like, well, we'll just X that one out and just go with the, these two I have here. Not how it works. They take all three, divide it by three, they add them all up, divide by three, and that's what your score is. So if you may have an 800 and 800 and a 400, your score dropped. 
Okay. So in that situation is they look at your score. Then they also use a computerized loan origination software. And they also use an automated underwriting software. Okay. And there's of course other internet applications. But what they do is they take all the information that you've given them and they kind of do a risk analysis to determine what's the chances of Mr. Eugene actually paying us back. And these systems also calculate risk. What are the chances of him losing his job? What are the chances of him passing away? What are the chances of the wife losing their job? What are the chances of there being a medical emergency? All these things are taken into play and they get a score. And then they make a determination to either green light or red light. Okay? And that's why when you're going through the underwriting process, it takes time. And there's a lot of times I've had one that it, we went back and forth in the underwriting at least 15 times. We'd submit it, they'd kick it back. Submit it, kick it back. Submit it, kick it back. Submit it, kick it back. Always for something different. Okay. Now your payment plans, you have different ways that you can make payments. Okay. Now the, the one that you always want to push your client to is what? Well, a fully amortized payment, which is basically a fixed payment. Why is that? Well, when you pay off your last note, Mr. Travis, you pay your last payment, you want to still have to pay more money? No. Heck no. You know, when you pay the last one, you'll be done. You'll be done. Right? So a fully amortized payment basically means when I pay my last payment, I'm done. Pay my interest, pay my principal, I'm done. I walk away. Okay. They do have, if Mr. Eugene, you want it to pay bi-weekly, you could. You can pay your mortgage bi-weekly if you wanted to. Okay. But again, you always, the best one is a monthly fully amortized fixed note. Okay. Because you're going to pay the same amount no matter what. What about an interest only payment? How many of y'all just want to pay interest only for 30 sounds, years? Ooh, that sounds fun. Yeah, it sounds horrible, right? Yeah. So an interest only plan is you just pay your interest. Guess what, Mr. Eugene? Your note, it's real small. Yeah. Real small. You just pay so, the yeah. interest. Yeah, but at the end, yeah, you get hit with a big amount of money that you gotta pay. Again, these interest only payments are very expensive. They cost you down the road. There's also flexible payments, and then, like Mr. Eugene said, a balloon payment. Okay, a balloon payment is at the very end, you pay a little, 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 and then you pay all or majority of your principal at the end. For $300,000, guess what? You may pay $300,000 at the end in one payment. Okay, not something you want to end up doing. So this shows you an example of what's called a fully amortized loan payment. If you notice here, look right here at the top. You'll see over here on the left-hand corner, you have your principal and interest, and the payment amount, so the, the interest is in black, the principal is in white, or clear, and if you notice here, what happens? In the beginning, you pay what? Majority of what, Mr. Eugene? Interest. Why, do they, why are they putting the, wait, wait a minute, why, why don't we put the principal and then the interest? Because they want to get their money up front. Yeah, because if you pay off your principal early, what's there to have interest on? That's why they set it up this way. It is let's put it this way where we apply very, very little here, and then we pay a lot of interest, 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 and then we'll start going to our principal. Okay, so again, this shows you kind of how they break it down. This right here provides you a flexible loan payment. Now, the thing about flexible loan payments is guess what? It's where you're going into that interest type thing, interest only. Because you are in a flexible payment, your interest rates get to go up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. So you never know what your interest rate's going to be. So one month, it's not monthly, it doesn't do monthly, but it does in certain periods, a certain adjustment period. But what happens is, is you may pay 6.9%, and then all of a sudden, Mr. Eugene, your deal just went up to 9%. Ooh, ew. Then it dropped to 8.2, and guess what? We then went back to 9.5. Oh, Don't that sound wonderful? Yeah, I that bad. I love roller coasters. 
Yeah, you know, it just sounds so wonderful, especially the money's involved. Right? Oh, yeah, you get paid, make payments. Flexible. Yeah, look how flexible this is, Mr. Eugene. Yeah, okay. Look, you at the very end, they dropped to 5.9 for you. So flexible. But look at how much majority of it has been above his 6.9 that he started off with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So again, in these situations, is you have to understand the breakdown. Okay, how they do this. Now again, we have conventional loans. Okay, and this these are your different types of loans that your clients going to use. They're going to use a conventional loan, an FHA loan, a VA loan, or an agricultural loan. Okay. Now understand under each of these, there's different types, but the conventional loan is the preferred loan. You got good credit, you want a conventional loan. 99 of the time, you want a conventional loan. Okay. But what if Stefan has never bought a house before? Would it be wise for Stefan to get a conventional loan? Well, do you have a lot of money Stefan put down? Oh, yeah, I got infinite support. Yeah, uh huh. All the money. Well, like on conventional loans, guess what? Some majority, not all, but majority require 20% down. Oh. So for every hundred thousand dollars, guess what? You have a twenty grand debt. But guess what happens with the FHA loan? You only have to put three and a half percent. So instead of twenty thousand dollars for every hundred thousand, you only have to put down thirty five hundred bucks. Not bad. Or let's say that Stefan served in the military, served in the army. Well, he's now a veteran. He's entitled to a what? That VA loan. So what happens there for you, Stephen? I don't know put any money down. They don't have to put no money down. Buy a house free. Okay. So again, there are some of these different benefits. And of course, if you're agricultural, there are different types depending upon uh, the rural development, uh, farm service agencies, many different places. Uh, and also USDA loans oftentimes falls underneath these. Now understand that under these loan programs, there are different types of areas. So there is the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs, uh, the Texas Veterans Land Board. Uh, but what we want to come into and I want to talk about mainly is about the conventional loans okay, and talk about the other ones. A conventional loan, like I said, is the most preferred. Okay, So it's not underwritten by a federal agency. This is basically if Mr. Keith needed to borrow money and you are a bank, Mr. Eugene, this is you giving your money to keep not a federal government, not a federal agency. You yourself are giving Keith the money to buy his house okay, as a bank. Now you can either make it conforming where it has to conform with the FHA or federal guidelines, or you can make it non-conforming. Okay. So it's up to you in regards to the discretion is up to the bank on what they want to do. <coughs> You also will set the qualifying for a loan, the terms that you're going to qualify, how's Keith going to get qualified, and understand when this situation, if Mr. Keith comes into your to your bank and say that he is a um, say he's an Asian male, comes into your bank, okay, can you end up say, well, I know that most Asian people pay their stuff, so I'm gonna to lend to him. But Stefan comes in and he's Hispanic, so I'm not going to lend to him. Can you do that? Okay. No, you can't do that. You cannot discriminate based upon race. So while you can end up qualifying for a loan, you cannot set the terms where you use any of those things that we talked about previously in discrimination. You cannot use those in these terms, just like in a situation. If Travis comes in and he has a family and it's him and his wife and their two kids and Travis is the sole supplier for their family, you can't say, nope, Travis, we're not going to give it because we don't think you can pay the bill. Can't do that. Can't do that. Can't do that. You're right. Cannot. Sorry. I only got that 9000 for my first year. <laughs> so in that situation <laughs> is you have to, yeah. you got to make certain in this particular situation that you got to make certain that qualifying for a loan is fair across the board for all people. That's why they have credit, so they can discriminate. Now they can, now understand, on, on credit, they cannot simply say, 
Well, Mr. Eugene, you got 700s and you're a white male, but Stephanie, you're Hispanic and you got 700s, but we don't like you because you're Hispanic. Can't do that. You, you you're going to get. If you also can't set his, you'll give it to him if he has 700, you'll give it to him if he has 725. That's right. You can't change that. That's right. Whatever you make it to one person, it has to be to everybody. Okay. So again, most of the time, if you want to know what the terms are, say, Mr. Eugene, you want to know what the terms are to get pre-approved. Most banks have to give you a sheet of how you can get pre-approved, what their standards. And you can look at it and see what are my, my chances of getting it. They're just like in leasing, you're supposed to give that stuff out. But you can actually go in and see what your odds are before you apply. Okay. Calculating the payment left up to the bank, not to the federal agency. Loan to value ratio, your LTV, up to you. Private mortgage insurance. This is that coverage for you in case step and don't pay. Okay. Discount points charges and loan origination fees. All of these things are left to the bank. The bank has the discretion. So long as the bank does not discriminate, okay? You cannot discriminate whatsoever. If you set, like Travis said, if you say 720 gets you a 2% interest rate, then it doesn't matter who walks in that door. If they have a 720, guess what? They get that 2%, period. You cannot come in and set qualifications or standards that are going to try to only allow one classification of people to get it. Okay. Loan amortization. This is what we talked about. So you take the monthly payment minus the monthly interest gives the amount paid towards the principal. Okay. This then it goes down and it breaks into the principal balance minus the amount paid towards the principal will equal your new principal balance which then could lead to the principal balance times the interest rate divided by 12 gives you approximately what your monthly interest is going to be, okay? Again, this kind of gives you a little example y'all can run through. It's just giving you an example of the payment versus the interest. What exactly is being broken down into interest being applied to principal? What's being applied to the interest, okay? Now, FHA loans. Now these loans, so the only loans that are not going to end up being, uh, that are not governmentally backed is the conventional. So when you take your test and it says that the only are the loans that are not going to end up, Mr. Eugene, uh, what is the only loans that are not governmentally backed? What are you going to say? Conventional. Conventional. You're going to say conventional. Conventional is the only one. Now, everything else is federally backed. FHA, VA, USDA, all them, they're all going to be federally backed. Okay? So it's insured by HUD. There's the down payment calculation that has to be provided. The mortgage insurance premium, the MIP, is going to be the same as the PMI. The only difference is, guess what? PMI falls off after you have 20%, that's again, 20% equity in your property. So when you own 20% equity in your property, Mr. Eugene, guess what your payment does? Drops about a hundred bucks. Drops about a hundred bucks. If you are in a conventional loan. But if you're in an FHA, does it ever fall off? stays till it's paid off, it does not fall off. So PMI will fall off at 80-20 split, while MIP stays on indefinitely until it's paid off, okay? Again, the terms for qualifying a loan is going to be set by who? The bank or the government? The government, because why? What's that say at the top? It's insured by the government. So the government sets certain qualifications for standards. The discount points and loan origination fees, these of course are gonna be set to a certain standard. And the assumption rules. Some loans can be assumed, meaning that Mr. Eugene, you may have an HA loan at 2%. And 
And now all of a sudden, prices have gone up 7% interest rate now, and Stefan wants to buy your house. Well, if Stefan can qualify to meet the terms of your FHA loan, he may just assume your note and continue to pay it out at the lower interest rate. Okay. Now, VA loans, they are guaranteed by the VA. They do have maximal values and the maximal values vary from city to city and state to state. We, uh, I had a good talk with a, a lender once and we were chit chatting and everything. And uh, he was telling me, he said, my very first loan I ever did was a VA loan. Because most people don't like touching VA loans just because it's a lot of work. Okay, Not saying that they don't, they just, it's a lot of work. So he got this one and the guy was moving from Hawaii here, not to College Station, but here in, a, in I think it was Colleen, Texas. He was in the military. He's moving from Hawaii to Colleen. But here's the thing, here's the most interesting thing, all right, is that in Hawaii, he was bringing in, he's getting stipends and all this stuff, so his salary was close to $6,000 a month with all of his stipends, which placed him at over $500,000 for a house. So he quoted the person and told them, he sent out a pre-qualification letter and all, and said, you know, he can get up to a $500,000 house. Well, they started looking. They put a contract in on the house for five hundred thousand dollars. The guy was ecstatic. They went into underwriting, and underwriting kicked it back and said, "No, he's only qualified for a hundred fifty thousand dollar house." Now, why in the world, Travis, would there be such a huge cut from him going over having five hundred down to one fifty? What could have caused that? What happened to the cost of living in Hawaii versus Killeen, Texas? It's much higher in Hawaii. It's much higher there. So when you come here, does he get all of those stipends and everything that he was getting there? So his pay did what? It dropped tremendously from 6000 to 2000 so in that situation is, he had already put a contract in, had ended up going through, got pre-approved or pre-qualified, was going through all this process to get pre-approved and all. They put a contract in, they're all in the process, and then all of a sudden, he can't get the house anymore. So in that situation, you see why it's also important as a real estate agent for you to stay on top of the lenders because of what? They can't make those mistakes. As a real estate agent, the agent should have said, especially if you're dealing with, with military, they do get stipends. They get supplements to their income depending upon where they live. And if you I have move a question. A, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Um, so had he stayed in Hawaii, he could have had the 500? That's correct. Because that's where he is. That's where he was making majority money. Oh, OK. But when he came here, because it's a different area, he took a hit. And I mean, he took a hit, but the house would have been about the same. Yeah. Like if he got a $500,000 house in Hawaii, it would have been about the same quality as a $100,000 house in Hawaii. That's correct. Because, okay. of the fact, because the fact is, is prices change where you're at. Yeah. Just like California. You go out to California, you, you want to go buy a $200,000 house in California, it's going to be a shack. Enjoy your shit. Yeah. <laughs> Over here, $200,000 house can get you a nice place. Okay. So again, that's one of the things you got to take or keep an eye out on. Okay. But they do have a maximum loan amount and it varies from area to area. Okay. They again are VA guaranteed. The only thing is, is that you get what's called a certificate of eligibility. So if, for example, Mr. Eugene, you were in the military, the lender, and this is where also as an agent, you would need to be helping out as well. If Mr. Eugene, you were in the military, Travis probably is dealing with a lot of clients every day as a lender. He's probably dealing with maybe 20 to 30 a day. Okay. So when Travis calls you, Mr. Eugene, and says, I need your certificate of eligibility, you say, okay, I'll get it. Travis ain't going to think about you anymore. 
until the next time he sets a reminder. Or until you send it in. Or until you send that form, right? One of the two. So it is the agent's responsibility to do what, Stefan? What should I be doing if I'm Mr. Eugene's agent? I should be calling. Mr. Eugene, have you got that form to Travis? Do you need help? Do you need me to show you where to go? Like what, what can I do to expedite the process? Okay. But it basically, as long as you give your certificate of eligibility, Mr. Eugene, you are now eligible to go over and Travis will say, okay, green light, you may proceed to the next step. Okay. There is a maximum amount, again, that the VA will guarantee. They do set certain qualifying standards. But here's the funny thing with VA loans. We do an appraisal on a house, and we call it an appraisal. In VA terms, it's called a notice of value, it's NOV. So here's something also that's interesting. The person that does the inspection of the property to make certain that it meets certain standards would be who in most situations? Who would do inspections, Travis? I'm gonna go with an inspector. Ooh, an inspector. Yeah. I'm sorry, but in, not for VA. in VAs, we allow the appraiser to do inspections. And it's awful. <laughs> We're, we're going to have the appraiser do inspections, but the inspector can never do appraisals. Make sense? Judging how wonderful our government is here on their, uh, on their organization here. So the inspector, their only real job is to do wood destroying insects or what we call WDI inspections. They're looking for wood destroying insects. But the appraiser also will go around the property to make a determination if there are repairs that need to be made before closing. And do not be surprised, and I've had this happen, do not be surprised if after you do a home inspection, Mr. Eugene, go do a home inspection with your client, and uh, y'all get these things and y'all fix them, that the appraiser or the inspector does not come back out and say, yeah, this doesn't meet our standards. You got to redo it. You're going to have to delay your closing. Yeah. So let me tell you, as a real estate agent, I have been in transactions. Now, of course, I cannot repair them. Okay. But I have been in transactions where they said, nope, this one little thing does, is not done correctly. And we also would like to see this painted, not just put up. So guess who had to go buy a can of paint and get out there and start painting so that we could just get them to sign off on it? This guy right here. I had to end up get out there and paint that thing just so I could get the transaction done. That's why as you will get to a chapter in this book, we're going to talk about all the careers that you do as a real estate agent. You do everything, everything, okay? So in that situation is, that's part of this process. They do have itemized fees and charges, and oftentimes there's a 1%, majority of the time, not often, majority of the time, uh, there is a 1% flat charge origination fee, okay? There, of course, are options for discount points and VA funding fees, as well as assumption rules as well. But the key thing I want you to remember on VA loans is you can only have how many VA loans active at a time, Mr. Grossman? Just one. You cannot have more than one at a time. Okay. Now there is also the agricultural loan programs. This is your farm service agency, the FSA loans. And these are direct and guaranteed loans to purchase farmland, construct or repair buildings, and they're made and serviced by local lenders, but they are, are guaranteed by the FSA, okay? And again, these are focused upon where, Mr. Eugene? Residential areas? Yeah. Industrial areas? Uh, not farm, right, or agriculture. But it's farm or agriculture, like it says. That's right. It's gonna be farm or agricultural focused, okay? 
They also do have rural development loans. And these are for home loans in rural communities. Oftentimes, these individuals are low or moderate income applicants. There is no down payment and no loan limits. Uh, these are no monthly mortgage insurance, no PMI or MIP. And oftentimes, the qualifying ratios is 29% over 41%. And there is a guarantee fee of a one-time upfront and annual fee that can be provided. There's also the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs. Uh, these individuals help very low to moderate income persons buy a home. Uh, this program is often the Texas First Time Home Buyer Program, and it includes down payment and closing cost assistance below market interest rates as well. Okay. Uh, these again also help like you said, the low and or very low and moderate income persons in regards to what's called the bootstrap loan program. It's where the borrower provides at least 65% of the labor to build a rehab, and it's up to 45,000 with a maximum of 90,000 on all loans. What this program is very similar, and you probably have seen these, it's similar to those ones of, is it Habitat for, to, for Humanity, or what's the one that builds houses? Um, it's Habitat. Yeah. Habitat for Humanity uh, has a program very similar to this. But what happens is, is Mr. Eugene, if you're very low income, you don't have probably if you're low with low income, you may end up you may not have a job, but you have a lot of time. So what they'll do is, is they'll help you get the, the stuff you need. But you're going to have to go out there and provide 65% of the labor. So meaning that you got to go out there and technically build your home. Okay. So what happens is, is the basic stuff like, you know, nailing and, and things to that nature and painting, that's on you. But the electrical, the plumbing, any of the, the more technical part, that's going to be on other individuals. Okay. Now, there is also the Texas Veterans Land Board. And these qualify as Texas veterans. So you have to be a Texas veteran. And there are programs for those veterans. There is the Veterans Housing Assistance Program. And this is where you can purchase your principal residence. And you have up to 417,000 is the maximum loan you can get. The Veterans Land Program also provides, it allows you to purchase at least one acre of land. And there's a loan up to $125,000 but you got to put 5% down, okay? There's also the home improvement program, which it allows for you to repair existing primary residents, and they will give you up to 25,000 in maximum loan. And you know right now, because of all the prices, Travis is $25,000 really a lot of money to upgrade or improve your property. No, no it's not. There, of course, are other financing techniques. Uh, one thing I want to tell you as a real estate agent, if your client is not familiar with how financing works, you do not, you do not let them get into an arm and you highly suggest that they stay away as much as they can because an arm is what's called an adjustable rate mortgage. And what happens with an adjustable rate is, yes, Mr. Eugene, it goes up and down. Well, I say up, 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 up. I don't ever yeah. see, very rarely do you see it come down, 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 down. Uh, but most of the time with an adjustable rate mortgage is it's majority up, 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 up. Okay. So you may start off with maybe a three or 4% interest rate. And by the time it's all said and done, you were went to a double digit interest rate. Okay. Uh, so again, adjustable rate are not something that I personally recommend unless your client knows what they're doing. If Travis, for example, your client, say Mr. Jason, he's been doing transactions and he knows real estate in and out, he may be fine with that. He knows what he's doing. I got this. But if I'm if I am representing Stefan who's never bought a house, well, what's the problem here? He don't know what that is and he could get stuck into this for 30 years and he start out at 3% and he end up at 15%. How do you like that, Stephen? Not at all, right? So again, adjustable rate mortgages 
do not do unless you are 100% certain you know everything. And let me say this, does that mean, Mr. Travis, that if Mr. Eugene's your client and he says, but I went and talked to uh, my lender, Mr. Justin, and, and he said, look at all the money that I'm saving in my monthly payment. And so, you know, and it's, it's going to be good in the beginning and all for me. And, and so that's why I'm doing it. What should you tell Mr. Uh, Eugene? You should call Jake. You should call Jake, right? Because the fact is, is that, no, what is Mr. Justin trying to do? Yeah. He's trying to get more money out of Mr. Eugene. Okay. Typical Mr. Yeah, that's right. Get more money, right? Milky, right? That's typical, a, Justin. typical Justin, right? Yeah. So in that situation is, is that you got to have that adjustable rate. You got to watch that. Okay. It's fine, Mr. Eugene, if you're going to go in and you're, you're going to buy a house and flip it in a year or two, that as long as it meets qualifications, it's fine if you get in there. Because yeah, you'll pay a little bit in the beginning and you're going to sell the thing. Who do you care? You don't give a crap. Okay. But if you're going to live there as your main residence, Probably not something that I would recommend. Okay. Uh, you can purchase buy downs where you can buy down interest rates or you can buy points. There's also uh, purchase money mortgages, again, equity loans. And I'm going to tell you something about this equity loan. I spent a lot of time talking about this when I'm talking in the classrooms. I do not ever, ever, ever recommend an equity line of credit or an equity loan. Ever. I had a, I used to, or I still do, I do credit counseling and I had a client one time, she took equity lines of credit out of her house to pay off her credit cards. And she's like, well, I'm, I'm broke. Uh, I, I pay off my credit cards, Mr. Justin. I paid them off. Yeah. Like, yeah, you went from an unsecured debt to a secure debt that now you could be homeless in. What were you thinking? Don't ever, don't ever take a home equity line of credit and pay off credit cards. Ever. People, for some reason, get in this wild idea that they need to pay off their debts. If you are using your money properly and you're actually everything you buy is a return on your investment, you don't care about this crap. You don't care about this. But it's something about the older generation, and I, and I think it's just even my dad, mom, they've ended up, they taught me as well. But the thing comes into it from this situation is, is that, yes, you want to pay off your debt. But like me and, me and another individual, we had a discussion about this matter. So, Mr. Eugene, say that you pay off your house. You go pay off your house. And you take that money, you pay it off. Well, your house, let's say, is only 2%. 2% interest. So over, say, 30 years, or let's say 15 years, your entire debt that you're going to pay on that 2% is, say, $30,000, $40,000. This shoot for a crazy number. $30,000, $40,000. Okay. So you get 2%, you pay off. But you could take that money that you have, let's say you have $100,000, that was your deal. You take that 100,000, you could go and invest that into a business or into stocks or to something else. You put that money into it, what happens now, Mr. Eugene? Well, that money possibly could do what? It could go higher. So that little 2% that you saved, that 30,000, that's now that money's gone, you basically screwed yourself. The key thing in these situations is, is people get into these ideas that I have to end up paying off my debts. If you are, if you are a wise individual, if you're somebody that thinks right, okay, your money should only be spent if it is on what? Should be spent ever on consumer products. No. If you have, and I can tell you that just from experience. I started my very first business with $150. That was washing cars. And my thank God my parents allowed me to use their water. Okay, as their water, and I had my own little stuff, but their water. And I went out and I bought my cleaning supplies and all, and I went out and I started washing vehicles. Okay, and I washed vehicles and I charged and I made money and I kept making money. Well, 
Well, I spent 150 and in two cars, I'd already made $150 back. Guess what? I've already made a basically broke even. But now what do I have in my possession? I now have cleaning supplies. I have the, the, the waxing stuff. I have all the stuff. My dad actually taught me about what all you need. So I had all this stuff. Well, once you clean two cars, Mr. Travis, does that mean that, oh, well, I can't clean anymore. I broke even. I just walk away, right? Is that how this works? Yep, you did it. Yeah, that's it. Okay, okay. Woo, I made my money back. Yep. No, what do you do? You, you keep going, and you keep going, and you keep going. I'm where I'm at today because my parents taught me, my dad taught me about these things, that, that if you spend money, what is my return on my investment? If I go out and I go buy a new pair of name brand shoes, say that Mr. Keith, he's created a name brand shoes. He's the owner of Nike. And I go buy Nike shoes, whose pocketbook am I really helping? Yes. I'm helping Keith, so he's getting money, but what also is he getting out of me, Travis? What's on my shoes? Branding. His logo. Mm -hmm. So now not only, I basically took, what, I took, I gave Keith my money, I took a product that has his logo on it, and what am I now doing? Walking around marketing Keith's money, or business for him. Yeah, some people will pay tons of money just for that name. Exactly. Do you see how this works? See, people, they don't, that's where you get the difference between an investor and a consumer. A consumer is somebody that they have to have things so that they think that they look cool. I saw some friends have been snapping me now that everybody's getting their stimulus tech checks. And people are out there and they're buying TVs and they're buying all these things. And, and I'm not saying don't do that. That's what they're that's what stimulus is for. But I'm saying the fact of the matter is, is that I've seen people spend this money on stuff. But what are they really doing? They're just they're giving the money to the rich to make them richer, and then they're marketing the product for them for free. If you see what I'm saying. How's that sound to you? I actually joke a lot. I said I should take my shirts and put them out for sale to see how many people will buy my shirts. Because the fact of the matter is that's what you do. You're literally in that situation. You're marketing for another person. But what happens is, and getting back to this point, is a lot of people take credit cards and they max out their credit cards. And once they max out their credit cards, guess what they end up doing? They go get a home equity loan and pay off those credit cards. Now, Mr. Nobles, Mr. Eugene here, they once they pay off, if Stefan paid off his credit card, now Stefan's never going to use that credit card again, right? He, he, he learned his lesson at that time, right? Yeah, right. Now, what's, what's he done? He's got, do it again. he got a clear slate, and now what's Stefan doing? Start all over again. Start all over and put himself right back in the hole. Yeah, then I go back down and give me the other last bit. Yeah, and eventually he's going to run out of what? He's going to run out of equity in his property. And if you run out of equity, he can't pay off the stuff. And now he not only lost his credit card, but we're also Danny Lawyer. Lost his house. Lost his house. Lost his house. So I never recommend that. I tell my people, if you ended up, you got yourself in the home credit cards, take the loss. Go on and, and just try to settle with them, deal with the lawsuit, whatever. Get it done and move on. But don't go and put yourself in a situation where you lose your home. Don't do that. There are other markets as well. There's the reverse uh, mortgage. Okay. Now these again are the home equity conversion mortgages. These are kind of basically traditional purchase or refinance. They do have share appreciation mortgages, package mortgages, and blanket mortgages. Again, one of the key things I want to tell you, let's see if there's any more. Yeah, there's some more here. Let me go on through these two. There's wraparound loans, open-ended mortgages, construction loans, sell and lease back, and contract for deed. Now, one thing I want to tell you about these situations, these, these last few, let's first start real quick with the reverse mortgage. A reverse mortgage is, in this situation, Mr. Eugene, you end up, you and your wife are older, your, your, God forbid, your wife passes, we're not going to wood, you're by yourself, you have no children that are taking care of you, you can't pay your bills, you need money. Well, you may get a reverse mortgage where the bank gives you money, okay, to help pay. But oftentimes when it's all said and done and you pass, 
the house is given to the bank. So your children don't get the house. Okay. And so reverse mortgage can be beneficial in some situations. But again, I always tell people, make certain you get advised by an attorney. If a client ever asks you, should I get into a reverse mortgage? Don't get advised by the lender. Okay. The lender's going to tell you what? Yeah, I get a sign. Sign. Okay. Go talk to an attorney. Not even a broker. Because a broker wants you to do what too? They may want you to sell it. Okay. So go talk to an attorney or a financial planner and have somebody actually advise you on this method. Okay. A package mortgage, be careful with. So Travis, you and Elizabeth go out and y'all go find this quaint little house that's just so pretty. It's it's basically, you know, this nice little cute little cabin, real nice, four acres. Elizabeth loves it. And inside it has a bunch of furniture already, and it's already furnished. And Elizabeth just loves all the furniture in there. Okay. Well, they tell you, Mr. Grossman here was the one that actually built it and all, and he's furnished it and all. And he tells you, say, you know what, Travis, we can actually make life so easy for you. We will leave everything in here, and we'll just put all of it together in one lump sum love. Oh, there you go. We'll just make it all so nice for you, Mr. Travis. We want to make it so sweet for him. Isn't that nice of Stephen, Mr. Sure. Eugene? Yes. yes. He's helping him out. Yes. So he wraps it all together and he says, you know, all of the furniture and all in here is worth uh, $50,000 and uh, the house is worth four hundred fifty. dollars So it's only going to be $500,000 for everything, Mr. Travis. Perfect. Sounds wonderful, right? Yeah. Man, he put in all this and Travis is getting his furniture and everything. So he, he just walks in and he's ready to go. Well, have any of you ever heard of this place called Ikea? What's what's Ikea? What's my factory? That's most of your furniture. How how good's quality? That is pretty good now, but it's okay. Most of the time, it's going to be the best quality, though. No, no. I kind of would say in some situations, some of these tables may be made from Ikea. To be honest with you, because some of them rock. Okay. But the thing is, is that, do you think, Mr. Eugene, that Stefan's going to put $50,000 worth of furniture in there for Mr. Travis? Heck no. He's going to go down to Walmart. He's going to go to Ikea. He's going to go to multiple different places, maybe even Dollar Store, and all these different places. He buys all this furniture and he decorates it. And he might have spent a whopping maybe seven, dollars $8,000 to furnish that whole house. Okay. But Stephen ain't going to tell Travis that. <laughs> Stephen's going to tell Travis that this entire thing was done. So we had a, a designer come in and stage the property and all this stuff. And we had a professional do all of this. And, you know, and it looks so beautiful. And, and you're getting that still of a deal, Travis. All this is worth probably $70,000, but we'll give it to you for $50,000. Thank you. Oh, so nice. Well, it's, here's the thing. You spent, let's just round it up to 10 on everything, 10000 You sell it to him 40 more. So you made a $40,000 profit. Okay? But you also built the house and all, so you made money out of that too. But here's the thing. Is Travis really only paying $50,000 for the, for the furniture in there? No. What did they do? They packaged it. So they put it all together. So now he's got to pay what on top of it? Interest on He's got to pay interest. So now that fifty thousand, really that ten thousand dollar furniture, by the time he pays it all off, he probably paid close to a hundred thousand dollars for that ten thousand dollar furniture. That's why I tell people all the time is they will try, and real estate agents are really good about that nowadays, is to make their houses stand out. Say that I wanted to sell Miss Leela's house, and Miss Leela's moving out. I may say, Miss Leela, I got a, I got a deal for you. Let me come in and stage your house. I won't charge you anything, but I want to put my my stuff in your house to stage it. But I want the right to sell my stuff in your house. So I'm not going to charge you to stage it. 
I'm just going to come in and put my stuff in there and stage your property. And then what I do is, is I put price tags on the stuff. And as people come through your house to look at it, they may not like her house, but what might they see? They see some furniture that they like. And then they'll call and say, well, my client's interested, interested in this couch. How much is the couch worth? How much is this worth? How much is that worth? And what ends up happening is, is they get a free showroom for the property, but what also, Miss Leela gets what out of it? Her house is staged, and most of the time staged very nicely. And in that situation, does that also not attract buyers as well? Yes. So in that situation is, you gotta be very careful on how these things are done. It's all sales, guys and gals, it's all sales. Again, like I said, is they can do wraparounds, they can do mortgage ins, construction loans, sell lease back. Mr. Uh, Mr. Grossman, you ever done one of them? Uh, yes. A sell lease back is this client, Mr. Eugene, you come in and you tell Mr. Grossman, I want you to sell my property, but I want to stay in it for six months while I find another property. So Mr. Eugene would sell the property, I purchase it. But Mr. Eugene does not move out for six months. So he can go find him another property. Okay. And then there's a contract for deed. And a contract for deed is basically what it sounds like. You end up, you're basically paying a payment until you do what? Until you paid it off. Okay. The government influence in the mortgage lending process, the Fed. You're going to need to know about the Fed. The Federal Reserve basically they have a huge impact on our daily lives, huge impact. The reserve, basically, there is an influence on the interest paid on excess reserves. There are discount rates that are set, as well as open market operations, okay? Mainly, the Fed's job is to do what? Keep prices where? Well, kind of keep, keep things in balance, okay? We don't want us to go to an inflation because if we go into inflation, what happens to prices? Through the roof. But what happens if we go into a recession? Is that good? No. So it's where you want to kind of keep it at a happy medium. Okay. Now, can you always keep things at a happy medium? No. We saw that with COVID. You may think that you control everything, but then what can end up happening? There could be a disease that can just hop, happen, and boom. What about storms? Can can we control hurricanes? Can we control tornadoes? No, we can't control those things. So in that situation is while the Fed ends up trying to keep things balanced, what happens? External factors do what? They can throw things out of line very quickly. And it takes us a very long time to do what? To rebound, okay? Now, the secondary mortgage market, this is where you have Fannie and Freddie. Now, Fannie Mae, basically, both of these actually are, are in, now in conservatorship with the FHFA. They used to be independent, but 2008, because they were not managing things properly, they ended up basically almost went bankruptcy. Okay. But Fannie and Freddie basically. Fannie deals with conventional FHA and VA. So as long as uh, loans are what we call conforming, what's conforming mean? They are consistently the same. Then they can be bought by Fannie and Freddie, which are governmental entities. Okay. There is also Jenny May, which also deals with FHA, VA, and FSA, and Farmer Mac, which deals with our real estate loans or agricultural real estate loans. But this is where we take that pool of money and we take that pool and we sell it off to these different organizations. So banks may have say 20, 30 loans and they say, okay, Mr. Eugene, we have these loans, you're Fannie. I want to sell these off to you so you can buy them from me and I can have more money. But if I don't give you good loans, what happens? They don't pay, you put them in the hole. That's what happened. They had mixed in 2008 prime loans, which what does prime mean? Best of the best. Okay, prime loans 
got mixed with subprime loans. So you're taking, like I always tell people, it's kind of like a teaching. What happens when you put a, Travis, I'm going to ask you because you just, you've been in school at all. What happens in this situation? If I put Mr. Eugene, an A student, with Stefan, an F student, and I put them in a group project, who's going to do all the work? Why is that? Because he's better than Stefan. Because he's better than Stefan. Because of the fact of the matter is, it's why? Stefan don't want to be in class. He don't want to deal with it. So he's going to have Eugene do all the work. And he's just going to sit back and do what? Get credit. credit for it. Okay? That's what happens. But what happens, Mr. Eugene, when it is you and multiple Stephens around you? Can you carry the whole load? No. And what happens? The whole thing collapses. Team gets an F. That's right. The whole team gets an F. So that's what happened in these, these pools is that they had a bunch of F's with A's, and eventually, with all of them collapsing and not paying, what happens to the entire market? Collapses. Okay. So there was the Dodd-Frank Act, and the Dodd-Frank Act in this particular situation is it came in to help regulate the markets. We do have the Regulation Z that also came in that was the Truth in Lending, and it requires the informed use of credit. And it applies to all transactions that secure a residence. The truth in lending, which is the TEAL statement, basically discloses the finance charge as well as the APR. And we're going to go into this in a little more detail as we continue, but we're actually going to stop at this point tonight. Okay, so we're going to stop here and pick up tomorrow going into regulations because I don't want to spend too much time. I want y'all to kind of uh, sit there and allow the whole different types of loans and the process. I want y'all to kind of simmer in those things because if I get into financing regulation, I think I'm really, really going to put you to sleep. I've already kind of put you to sleep with the, the other stuff, but I want to put you to more sleep. Okay, so we're going to stop here. So Stephen, go ahead and stop our lecture for tonight.